Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Michael Blakely, and I am the CEO and founder of the Entrepreneurs Collective. Um, and I'm very excited for our pitch competition tonight. Not only do we have three great judges, uh, but we've got probably one of our strongest lineups to date of startups uh, for you guys to, to, to look over. Um, but before we introduce you to the judges and the startups, just to let you know a little bit more about myself, um, uh, I am a founder of VC, yes, but first and foremost, I was a lawyer. Uh, but then I decided to build my own startup, which I went a bit rogue and I built a dating app. Uh, which is a bit different from my day to day. So as you might expect, um, being a first time entrepreneur, it took me a little little while to, to get going and really understand what was going on. Um, but what I realized on this journey was that actually being a successful entrepreneur is tough. There's a reason why there's why not why why 90% of startups fail. Uh, and that's because actually there are a lot of obstacles to 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 to, to overcome. You know, what do you do um, uh, or where do you go to find investment? Who do you talk to when you want some good referrals uh, to developers or to uh, service providers? Uh, where do you, who do you go and ask for advice and who do you, who can you trust? Uh, and actually very importantly also, uh, when things are going tough, who do you go and speak to and talk to, to uh, just, you know, bounce ideas and to help yourself work out that actually this is part of the startup journey. Uh, I tried going to a few events myself in, in London, but uh, I saw that there was actually quite a lot of poor quality events. Uh, a lot of the time when I was there, um, I met people trying to sell me things uh, and I really struggled to find genuine founders. So being an entrepreneur, uh, I decided to uh, make my own. So this is sort of where EC came from, which was to solve my own need, which was to help myself uh, and my own startup. Uh, and that's where our mission comes from, which is founders helping founders. Uh, and we believe that the best people um, uh, to help founders are people who have been on that journey uh, with us and, and who, are, who, are, who, can, who can give the advice and guidance to help you uh, jump up a few, uh, a few steps. Uh, next slide, thanks. Uh, in terms of tonight, so um, we'll introduce you to the judges shortly and explain how the pitch competition works. Uh, we'll then have the, the, the pitches. Uh, each of the pitches gets five minutes uh, to, to pitch and also five minutes of questions. Normally that's one question from each judge. Uh, and then um, uh, we will open it up for the audience uh, to, um, to vote on their favorite startups and also the judges uh, will, uh, will put in place their scorecards. Uh, after this, we'll announce our results and then also uh, move across to networking in Zoom rooms. So we will essentially break all you guys up and this can be a super useful part of the night where you actually get to talk to some other founders and some and some new people uh, and actually make some connections. And we've had people uh, find co-founders, cool get investment and a whole range of things uh, during the, 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 the networking sessions. Uh, but let me introduce you to uh, our judges. Um, uh, I will just give you uh, some highlights and then I'll let the judges uh, tell, tell you a little bit more about them themselves. Uh, we're very lucky to have with us tonight uh, Michael Tobin, OBE. Uh, you know, uh, the list of his, his entrepreneurial achievements uh, are fairly lengthy, so I'm only going to give you a few of them. Uh, but Ernst & Young, Entrepreneur of the Decade, uh, OBE for his services to the digital economy, um, uh, having built and uh, uh, exited multiple, multiple companies, uh, author, um, having also in his spare time was it run 40 marathons in 40 days uh, and done, you know achieved a lot in the sphere of charity. Uh, I think that's probably just a few of his, but uh, I'll, I'll let you, um, I'll hand over to Michael and he can tell you a little bit more about himself, um, what makes him tick and, 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 and what he looks for um, in a startup. Over to you, Michael. Thanks for Thanks very much, Michael. Um, yeah, I almost didn't recognize myself there. Um, <laughs> 
well, you know, I, I didn't go to university. I, um, I left school at 16 and did an apprenticeship in electronics engineering, um, but uh, also spent a bit of time in Africa getting petrol bombed and shot at. And I think that's one of the things that probably set me up uh, bizarrely um, for, for this, this, this strange world we live in. And, and I think the most important thing to remember as, a, as an entrepreneur is, is that um, you're going to get things wrong um, and it's okay because getting things wrong is a learning curve to getting it right. And, um, you know, resilience is the most important thing that, that you need to, to be successful. Um, and if you can maintain um, spirit um, and a belief, then I think that will be your greatest asset throughout your entire life. Um, so I have nothing else to add, really. You know as much as I do now. Well, it's our pleasure to have you here, and thank you, Michael. Uh, and next, I'm going to int in introduce you to um, uh, a a Andrew. Is, a, is, is, is not here at the moment, so we're going to skip across to, to, to introduce you to Stefan. Uh, Stefan is a, a serial uh, angel investor, um, and also, uh, uh, you know, has worked in the credit markets. Uh, probably one of the only chaps to I know to manage to be both an investor and a co-founder whilst working a full-time job uh, and recently had his first exit. So Stefan, how, how have you managed to, to do all this? Tell us a little bit more about you and, and, and what you look for in a startup. Oh, you might be on mute. Can we get rid of your... Hey, can you guys hear me? Ah, yeah, I can only second Michael, you know, absolute persistence and determination that drives it. You know, you need to be determined to do that every day. I, I did come to London and I quite easily got fixed up with a startup community. And then uh, working for a hedge fund, um, I never lost sight of what I wanted to do, that I wanted to found a business. And I was glad that I had the possibility to do that part time. And that business has grown quite rapidly to 25 people. And um, it was acquired by a private equity based, private equity backed strategic buyer in, in February. So it was quite a journey, which, which, which taught me a lot. And what I was amazed is we did so much things wrong and it still works out. So what I can say is people don't get discouraged because yeah. You know, like doing things wrong or getting things wrong or getting setbacks is the most normal thing ever. Just imagine, you know, if you improve and you can stop that, what what a, what a machine you will be, you know. So that's that's quite encouraging. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Stefan. Um, uh, as we are um, short of uh, a, a judge uh, this evening, uh, I think maybe we'll see if Andrew is going to turn up shortly. Um, but for now, uh, I will jump in and take his place. Oh, I think I just saw him yeah, arrive. He's just arrived. Okay, perfect timing. Okay. And do we have Andrew Davidson in the room? Yeah, hi. Sorry, as, last, last in the very least. Uh, <laughs> as if by magic, your picture appeared, and then here you were. I was just saying, it looks, it looks like he's got, he's had a better offer. Um, but uh, yeah. there you go, and you, you appeared. So um, I, I'll let you int introduce yourself, uh, Andrew, uh, a, a serial in in investor um, and a, a regular on our um, our judging panel, um, to loved and feared uh, alike by our contestants. Well, I have not feared, but anyway, look, I've been, a, <laughs> been an agent investor for about 10, 12 years. Um, spread across a number of sectors. Look, 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 I try and be as helpful as possible on LinkedIn in terms of what I'm looking for and what I'm not looking for. I also give a list of uh, my the main current investments. I'm pretty global. I've got investments in New Zealand, um, Bangladesh, India, Germany, Norway, the UK and the US. Um, and I'm particularly interested in fintech at the moment, if anyone's out there. But I've, I've had a look at the decks tonight and they all look very interesting. Looking forward to the time. Okay, great stuff. And that makes up our, uh, our judging panel for this evening, uh, uh, which is great. So now we're going to hand over to the startups. Um, but just before we do, a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, when it comes to people presenting and, 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 uh, and pitching their startups, um, 
you know, feel free to post questions in the discussion chat box and we will try and get to them if we can. Um, but please also respect the people who are pitching by not using that opportunity to self promote your startups um, uh, or to use the, the chat group. We'd like to keep the chat group there so we can have some interactions, but it's, you know, it stops being useful or interesting um, if we have 100 people all trying to, to, to sell services or pitch their businesses. Uh, so please refrain from doing that. We have a networking section at the end, uh, and that's the, that's the place where you get to meet other people and you can tell them uh, what a great company you have. Uh, uh, but without further ado, uh, we will kick off. Uh, it's um, pitch time. So we have Generate and Sam up first. So Sam, are you with us? Fantastic, I am, yes. I'm just trying to share my screen. I'm going to full screen mode. Please let me know when you can see the slides. Okay, yeah, looking good. Okay, let's get you on your timer. Excellent, ready? Right. Go for it, Sam. Fantastic, so firstly, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to, to speak and share Generate with you guys today. So very quickly before jumping in about myself, um, so before founding Generate, I was a global brand manager at Red Bull, um, responsible for one third of their worldwide advertising. So I was deploying about 180 million euros per year, and this was going across all forms of me media. So TV, radio, print, digital, and so on. And it's from here that I saw the opportunity for a business like Generate. And the reason for that is because I realized that it's all about data. In, the, in 2018, The Economist famously said that the world's most valuable resource is no longer oil, but data. And that is why everything that we do online is being covertly tracked and our data is sold to advertisers. But government regulations and shifting consumer sentiment is forcing this to change. And advertisers are desperately looking for new methods to access first party data in a legally compliant manner. Enter Generate. So Generate is a browser that lets people choose whether companies can access their data or not by selecting rewards mode or privacy mode. In rewards mode, people earn from their data themselves. And in privacy mode, we keep people's data private. We stop companies from tracking them online. So we sit at the intersection of two massive markets with data and analytics valued at 123 billion, forecast to reach 232 billion by 2024, and digital advertising sitting at 340 billion, growing by 17% year on year. So how do we make money? What do we do? Well, right now we are pre-revenue. Oops, sorry. We are pre-revenue, but we have a very clear path to monetization. And we're focusing on monetizing our data through advertising. So step one, we use our proprietary data. So when a user chooses rewards mode, they share their data with us so that we can create value from it and share the revenue back with them. So step one is that we use our proprietary data to identify high value audiences for advertisers. And we have more than 10,000 data points for the average user in rewards mode. That includes where they browse, which sites they go to and what they purchase online. So their, their purchase data, most interestingly. Step two, we then package our audiences and sell the ad space, that's the advertising they see, programmatically. Programmatic is just a posh industry word for in an automated fashion. So with 1 million users, we will achieve 28.8 million in annual revenue. So what's our road to a million users? Well, simple. We're taking a two-pronged approach. A, forming strategic partnerships. We're currently speaking with Hewlett Packard to get pre-installed on their machines. If this goes through, it would deliver millions of users very, very quickly. And the second prong B is that we're continuing to grow organically and via marketing. So we know our cost of user acquisition and we've got some really exciting and interesting upcoming publicity. We actually air on Dragon's Den tomorrow night at BBC One 8 p.m. Then I've got a live interview lined up on BBC One on Friday morning. Uh, we're also on the One Show next week. We're talking with this morning and we have lots more coming. So right now, where are we? Well, we've got 100,000 users currently on Generate. 
Um, the press are super complimentary. The Evening Standard have called us one of London's rising tech stars. And most importantly, we have all of the right skill sets in our team already. We've also got fantastic investors on board and we're looking to add more. To date, we've raised about 1.2 million and that includes Peter Jones from Dragon's Den and Tuka Sullivan, um, John Mitchell, the former managing director of Spotify, as well as other interesting characters. And we're now raising money to accelerate our momentum. This will enable us to bring on some key roles, start driving revenue and also develop and build out Generate for Mobile. So we're raising 750,000 for 12.5%. So that's a 6 million valuation. And I'm very confident that we'll access these funds quickly. I'm happy to talk about that in more detail in a moment, but really we're looking for some people who can come on board and add some value along the way with us. So that concludes my pitch and thank you very much. Right. Okay. Splendid, Sam. Uh, with 25 seconds to spare as well. So uh, you, you kept very good time. And it's great to see uh, that uh, the Entrepreneurs Collective pitch night uh, is getting in there first before the, the, the BBC and, and, and the One Show. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, that, that. That'll be going up on our website somewhere. Um, uh, but without further ado, let's um, hand you over. I'm sure our judges um, have got some questions. Uh, so why don't we uh, kick off with you, Michael? If you can unmute him, please. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, right, well, thank you, Sam. Um, you've spoiled my viewing of Dragon's Den already. Uh, <laughs> right. um, look, I think I think you're you're absolutely in in the right space. Um, I chair a company called Audio Boom, which is a, the, the largest podcasting platform in Europe, and um, makes a lot of money out of advertising. We're seeing tremendous growth, and I think advertising took a hit with COVID. Um, uh, but it's come back very strongly in genres which are very specific to your offering. In other words, where people can be very, very focused, advertising has come back in a very big way, and where there's more generalist advertising, it's fallen off a cliff. So I think, I think that is a, an interesting concept. Where do you stand when it comes to um, the recent Apple announcement as of yesterday, um, specifically on podcasts, which said basically we, we're going subscription-based, no advertising um, because if the if the world goes towards the spotify stroke um, apple approach that does leave you a little bit exposed don't you think so firstly thank you so much um, for that kind of feedback and input and overview michael you've obviously got a phenomenal um, understanding of the space so if i zoom out for a moment because i think the easiest way to answer is just to give you a macro view um, really really simply um, if I look at the way that the market's moving from a, a holistic perspective, if we look about at the half a trillion of ad spend each year, what's really, really clear is that people's data is inherently valuable. Um, and the way that the world works right now is that everything we do online is being tracked. Hundreds and even thousands of data brokers are hoovering up people's information and selling that onwards. Um, for example, if you use the world's largest search engine right now, if you use Google and you want to opt out and stop them from tracking your data, it will take you 17 clicks to do so. That's crazy. So where I see the massive opportunity, very simply, is in being transparent with people, in telling people that their data is valuable and there's different ways to unlock that value. And that if they share that with us, or actually that they have a choice, A, to stop companies from accessing their data, or B, they can share it with us and we can unlock the value with them. So to come back to your point, advertising and directly advertising, selling media is one way of unlocking that value. But we're very confident that there's um, some phenomenal revenue streams that aren't directly advertising related. I don't want to go too tangential, so I'll try and I get it. So I have one one follow up question. Sorry, I don't want to hog the um, the, 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 the mic here, here. But so, so when, when you look at advertising um, or, or when you look at when you look at the data capture um, that you're using here, um, I tend to think of it as um, immediate information, as in you could be standing in front of a billboard, um, which could be used or repository information which builds over time a picture of you a profile of you so you're spending patterns you know the fact that you go for the same walk every day that sort of thing so how do you, how do you think about um splitting those two elements and do you split those two elements and how, how do you how would you kind of monetize them separately 
Exactly. So it's the second, the second repository data, how you phrased it, is what we capture. So when you use generate and you opt into rewards mode, we ultimately use kind of smart tracking to have an understanding of everything that you do online. So where you go, what sites you visit, your duration there, which blogs you're reading and what you purchase. So I was on the call with Unilever yesterday because they got in touch and they said, hey, the world is moving to post cookies, which means we're gonna lose all of this data that we currently have on people that visit our website. We need to find a way to plug this gap. And what Generate does, or what we can offer, is A, the ability to understand who is visiting your site, but not just your site, any, like what do, where do your customers go? We have a full understanding in an anonymized fashion of a person's entire browsing history. So we don't just, um, I'll try and be super quick. If you're a high value retailer right now, you know what a person does on your website and you might know how they've got there, but you have no visibility on where they go afterwards. If they don't complete a purchase, which site do they go to next? Do they buy from your competitor? If so, was that price driven? We have all of those answers and that's, um, yeah, a, a real pot of gold. Yeah. Okay. Great stuff. Right. We're going to have to pass you along. Uh, we're running a bit over on our questions. Uh, so over to you, Andrew. Hi, um, really interesting, um, really interesting pitch. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, yeah, this is a huge area, huge, huge area. People are starting to realize when something's free, they're the product. Um, and obviously there's some huge, huge businesses that have done incredibly well over the last 15 years, Facebook, Google, Amazon, uh, Apple, etc. And there's a huge battle going on obviously with uh, instigated with legislation changes in the EU and, and, and all the rest of it, and obviously GDPR in the UK and, and across the rest of the world and other forms. Uh, and, and it's starting to, I think the fight back is starting. Uh, you know, we've got the Daily Mail having a, uh, bringing out a uh, uh, legal challenge with Google yesterday. We've got, as I say, Apple doing it. There's a huge ding dong between um, Facebook and Google, et cetera, et cetera. I think this is a great business. Um, one thing I would say is, how do you actually attract people to you? Because, for example, you know, I'm old. Um, my kids, uh, my daughter, she's 26. She and her boyfriend have got an Alexa. Um, my, my, my wife is in the uh, digital marketing and she's a Google advertising and a Facebook advertising uh, business. Um, we, we refuse to have an Alexa in the house. Um, but whereas my kids, they couldn't care less. Um, and, you know, this Alexa is just gathering more and more data about how you will live your life, et cetera, et cetera. Where's the actual appetite with the younger demographic or the demographic that is probably unaware of what uh, Big Brother is doing? Yeah, no, it's a fantastic question. So in terms of, so thank you so much, Andrew. In terms of user acquisition, what we see is that there's, step one is a, a simple education piece. So what we do in, in our marketing, and this is, if I look at the 100,000 users that we acquired, I'll, I'll give you a quick breakdown. We see one third come from referrals, which is friends inviting friends, one third come organically, and a remaining third come from uh, paid advertising, where we acquire at a cost of one pound 10 per user. And we've tr tried and tested over 1,800 iterations of advertising on Facebook and Instagram. So we really test color, copy, message, image to understand what, what creates the, the download? And the answer is really simple. Um, we know that by using credible ambassadors, so by using, for example, Peter Jones and Tuka Sullivan, showing a face that someone recognizes, and very simply just telling them the story, the fact that right now everything you do online is being tracked, companies that you've never heard of are making money from your data, that hey, Andrew, you can stop that. Download Generate, choose Privacy Mode, we'll stop it, or choose rewards mode and you can share in that wealth. And that's what we see uh, drives big acquisition or quick acquisition. So we're confident we can scale up through paid, paid acquisition. But what's really exciting is this first prong that I mentioned in the, in the presentation, which is a manufacturer deal or relationship. So for example, Hewlett Packard, who we're speaking with at the moment, if that fails, we've got Samsung next with conversations lined up. But ultimately, uh, if one of these come off, it would deliver tens of millions of users, which would change the business overnight. And that's why, from an investment perspective, the reason that guys, um, the reason the proposition is so exciting is um, there's a real uh, opportunity for a hundred times return if we execute this correctly. Okay, great stuff. Uh, sorry, put, I think you were muted, Andrew. Sorry, are the, are the two dragons, are they investors or are they just influencers? 
Uh, they're investors, yeah, so they're on board. So I was filming with Peter yesterday. We've got some promo videos that we'll put live tomorrow. And yeah, he's opened the doors to the CEOs of Hewlett Packard. And well, others. he's you know he's a great name and a very trusted name. So good luck. Great, great stuff. And over to you, Stefan. Yeah, thanks. Um, great business. Many questions. Um, just just a few. One is basically with cookie tracking. The problem I always faced was you know when I buy something, I I tend to get a lot of advertising already although I was already converted a customer. Um, I would be curious to see how you track purchase data and whether you can actually um, solve that issue to, to make that advertising a little bit more targeted. Yeah. Or how do you do it? Thanks so much, Stefan. So I'll try and be super respectful of time. Um, so short answer, yes, we've got the information, we've got the data, so it is possible to um, have more targeted advertising, but really everything we do is focused on the user. That's our real client. It's the end user, our consumer. So what we do is we give them a profile and we say, hey, you tell us what you're interested in, complete your preferences, and we're going to target the advertising to be based on these preferences. What we will be rolling out soon is almost like a thumbs up, thumbs down button, where if people are getting, say, retargeted with um, a pair of shoes and they want that to stop, they can just hit thumbs down and it will go away and we, we tag that. Um, but we could also be more elegant in the way that you suggested where we use the purchase data to therefore remove um, that ad uh, from their ecosystem. And, and last, just follow up, do, are you showing users additional advertising on your browser or is it um, you just basically people buy your metadata that show you advertising anyways, or is it like a combined approach or how you- The second. So we do not, from a user's perspective, they're not seeing any more ads than they would otherwise see. In fact, they see a lot less because what we do is we remove as a first step, all of the, the kind of aggressive pop-up kind of rubbish. Um, and we give a, lot, a much, much cleaner um, experience. So it's the embedded IAB formats. Yep. Uh, okay, we, well, we better call it there so, um, so, so we give time for some of the other pitches. Um, one quick question from the, the audience. Um, so how, do, how, um, uh, how much does an average user earn in a, in a month or, what, or, or how, how much will they earn? Cool. Yes. Yeah, so right now, our average user is redeeming between five and twenty-five pounds in rewards and value per month. And just to add a little bit to that, the reason that this is really kind of interesting and clever yeah. is we um, partner with ultimately lots of different companies to get exclusive deals and exclusive offers, which are cost-free to us. So we can use these redemptions as a profit center. So, for example, um, in the last month, we'd have had over a thousand people redeem a seventy-five pound voucher for Naked Wines or 500 people redeemed um, a free shave kit from Dollar Shave Club. And of course the user's happy because they've got value for nothing from their data and it's not a monetary cost to us. Okay, data equals wine, I like that. Absolutely, okay. thank you so much. All right, very good, very good. Um, okay, and next up we have Marco. Can we have Marco? Hello, hello everybody, can you hear me? Uh, yes, perfect. Marco, uh, right, let me get, put your timer up uh, and we'll get you kicked off. Five minutes starting from now. Go for it, Marco. Uh, one second, I'm sharing the screen. Okay, can you see it? Oh, sorry, I thought it was your screen. Yeah, very good. Cool. So ladies and gentlemen, I am Marco Flippi, CEO and founder of Volvero. The, there is a huge problem related to the transportation and mobility industry. And I'm referring to the fact that for 96% uh, of their time, cars and vehicles remain parked. Parked or uh, idle or unsold in the shops. And that's because uh, there, are a strong, uh, there are strong trends in the uh, behaviors of uh, people and also trend uh, that are uh, happening in the uh, in the society. I am uh, indeed referring to the fact that uh, millennials are not even uh, uh, buying uh, cars and vehicles anymore. And uh, for those owners that already bought one, um, for most of the time, they are not uh, using it. This is causing uh, a lot of troubles, such as uh, wasted uh, uh, spaces in the cities and uh, also a waste in natural resources that uh, are used for producing uh, uh, new vehicles. And all of this is happening while millions of people all over the world are not able to find optimal solution for their mobility needs. 
Indeed, uh, Carenta uh, is rigid, not user friendly, and never evolved their business uh, uh, in the last 30 years. Car sharing offers just limited usability and it's very expensive, and public transport is uh, not reliable, uh, usually not flexible uh, and uh, crowded. Our solution is uh, an app, Volvero, for connecting owners and drivers of vehicles in order to share them while leveraging the most advanced technology for monitoring and raising user awareness. Uh, the space uh, is becoming very interesting. So uh, there are, of course, some competitors, especially in the United States and in the UK, while in the rest of Europe, there are just some uh, uh, smaller and local players in the industry. But we are unique because uh, first, we have developed our own insurance policy in partnership with a, a global player. And this insurance policy allow us to be the only solution for covering uh, different types of vehicles, such as cars, motorcycles, or uh, light trucks and recreational vehicles. And uh, also we can deliver the service not only for the peer-to-peer -peer space, but also for to the B2C. And uh, the other uh, uh, distinguishing point for us is that we are really uh, using uh, the technology in a different way. We have two uh, global patents for uh, our technology uh, and what we do. Uh, embedded in our app, there is a, a software that based on the uh, sensor of the mobile phone, uh, like GPS, gyroscope, or the accelerometer, is uh, tracking users when they are driving. And based on uh, this uh, data that we collect, uh, we analyze data and we revert the scores to uh, drivers and owners. These scores are then used for uh, uh, improving uh, the user awareness, lowering asymmetric information uh, in, the, in, the, in the marketplace and also for gamification purposes. We were born two years ago. We are an Italian company. Uh, indeed, we did a pilot in Italy uh, before COVID, we were almost ready to roll out the service, but of course, because of COVID, we prefer to wait. We are in uh, uh, the rollout phase right now. Uh, Italy is our beachhead market, but we already have agreement in place for a pilot in uh, Santiago de Chile uh, for the second part of 2021, and uh, also other uh, ideas for scaling and, uh, of course, UK is one of the market we are targeting at the beginning of 2022. The team is composed by myself. I have experience in finance and uh, uh, team management. My co-founders, they are uh, technical founders, uh, 50 years of experience uh, uh, in the AI and IT and a well uh, mixed advisory board. We make money just by retaining a percentage on uh, each transaction. That's very simple. And uh, we are here today because we are seeking an investment of one and a quarter million United States dollar. 60% of it uh, is already committed. So we are looking for roughly uh, 500,000 uh, uh, coming from uh, a lead mm -hmm. investor. And we are uh, seeking it for hiring, sales and marketing and R&D. Ladies and gentlemen, I am Marco Filippi, CEO and founder of Volvero. Thank you. Okay, great stuff, um, Marco. Uh, and just slightly over, but uh, pretty much bang on. Uh, so let's go um, head over to you, uh, Andrew, to kick us off with the questions. Hi, hi, Marco. Uh, interesting pitch, thank you. Um, so one, two, five, what's, what's your pre-money valuation? Yeah, the pre-money valuation is of six million United States dollar. And you've already, said you've already, you've already, uh, Got a, a cornerstone of half a million bucks, have we? Uh, we already have uh, sixty percent of it committed uh, by okay. Uh, okay. public uh, public uh, fund yeah. based in uh, Portugal. Okay, there's there's a business in the UK that um, I was aware of because the the guys are next door neighbour actually uh, called Hire Car, which is doing a very similar thing. You've obviously heard of Hire Car. How 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 are you different to Hire Car? Because yeah, that's well, have... that's actually found it quite difficult to get real traction. It's starting to get it now, but it's it's taken a long time. 
Yeah, of course. It's taking a lot of time because this uh, kind of service is something different that didn't exist before. So uh, uh, companies like Hayakar are, uh, of course, uh, investing in educated uh, in educating customers, which is good for for us because, of course, we are kind of following uh, these uh, kind of companies. Uh, but uh, IACAR is mainly targeting the peer-to-peer -peer space, if I'm not wrong. We are uh, more offering our service for uh, also the B2C space, which is very relevant. Indeed, if you think of car dealership, they, they see their sales dropping uh, on a yearly basis rather than uh, uh, rather than increasing, and also car rentals. For instance, in Italy, there are many car rentals uh, that are uh, reaching out because they want to use our app uh, and our platform to rent out vehicles because we really digitalized everything and uh, we really made things simple for the final users to use our app. So you're B2B rather than B2C or C2C? We were born as peer-to-peer -peer, uh, with the initial idea, but then we discovered that uh, the uh, big opportunity lies on uh, the B2C. So thanks to our insurance policy, we can offer the service both, both for the peer-to-peer -peer space and uh, for the B2C space. So we are sort of an hybrid. Yeah, it's interesting because that, that's what Hayakar have changed to B2C, basically, but anyway. Okay, thanks very much and good luck. Okay, great Thank stuff. You. And over to you, Stefan. Yes, I mean, obviously, um, it's, it's a space that makes totally sense, but there's quite a lot of competition. So I, I would love to know, um, wh what is your user acquisition cost? And what, what's your what's your customer lifetime value? How, how what, what, what are you thinking around that? And, 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 and following up from Andrew's question, actually, how do you compete for users? Yeah, uh, so the acquisition cost is still uh, pretty pretty high. Is uh, around uh, uh, 150 United States dollar right now, but of course that's uh, also normal because we are uh, um, an early stage company, and uh, the um, and the LTV uh, is of more or less 200 to 230 United States dollar. Uh, but of course, we, we expect to shrink uh, the CAC down to 65 to 70 United States dollar. Uh, mm -hmm. the, what was the second part of your question, Stefan? Sorry, I missed uh, it. No, no, it's just, it's just that question also, uh, to, just to make sure I understand it right. Are you guys providing your cars or you're offering a marketplace where you need people to provide cars and people to rent those cars? Yeah, you got it right. We are only providing the marketplace, so we don't uh, owe any physical asset. And and the acquisition cost was that for the renter or was that for the um, lesser of the, the owner of the car or the people that rent cars? Yeah, that's uh, that's for uh, who drives the car. Who owns the car, basically? So that's uh, to no, get no, for for who is asking uh, cars and uh, vehicles. And because how how. For, for for the for for owners of car, for us the acquisition cost is uh, very low right now because we have some uh, uh, agreement with uh, main car dealers and the car rentals uh, in Italy especially that uh, really push down the acquisition cost uh, uh, since with just the one agreement we were able to secure more than hundred vehicles for instance. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great stuff. And uh, over to you, Michael. Thanks. Um, thanks, Marco. Um, Marco, I, I just um, benefiting from the fact that I didn't ask the I wasn't able, uh, didn't have to ask the first question there, um, and I and I also benefited from the fact that I'm sitting at my computer. Um, I just quickly Googled um, you know, peer to peer car rentals, and I came up with churro hire car, get around social car, driving Maven zip car. B rides, trip and drive. There's a there's a lot of players in the market. Um, how do you differentiate yourself? What's you know what's your special source? Yeah, great question. So uh, most of the of the players are still a uh, uh, United States company, and uh, they are still there. Uh, the problem with our uh, with our service is that. Uh, 
uh, we really need to be compliant with uh, uh, the regulation in uh, every different country. And that's the reason why there are so many uh, small or many big competitors, because uh, we really need to, uh, it's very difficult for uh, someone in our position to scale to uh, other countries, just because every country is very different. So in every country, there are solutions that are coming, uh, uh, coming out that are local and uh, are, for instance, uh, the, um, uh, are those companies that uh, in the future will be acquired by those companies that will uh, manage to scale internationally. In our case, our uh, secret sauce uh, is also coming from uh, the fact that we have this agreement uh, and this partnership with one of the biggest uh, uh, insurance company in the world. So the insurance policy that we have developed is part of our IP and uh, the agreement we have with this uh, group uh, allow us to propose the same uh, insurance policy in uh, a new country when we want to scale in just eight weeks. So we are in the position of uh, being uh, the company that uh, will take over fast in Europe and also outside Europe, because as explained, we already have agreement in place for uh, running pilots in uh, Latin America. And thanks to this, we will be able to scale quickly and uh, faster than uh, other companies. Okay, thank you, thank you. And who is the insurance company? Are you allowed to say? Yes, it's Europe Assistance. They have uh, more than, uh, uh, they have offices in more than 50 countries all over the world. Yeah. So this is clearly a, a, a great, uh, great. Thank you. And, okay. Uh, congrats great. for your 40 marathons. I yeah. run one, and uh, <laughs> that's more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great stuff, and thank you, Marco. Uh, now we're going to head over to Liz and Wojo. Do we have Liz here? Hello. Yeah, I'm here. Okay, splendid. Sharing my deck. Okay, great stuff. Let me Okay, yeah, let me get the tanner up. Yep, go for it. Perfect. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Liz, and let me tell you about Wojo, a digital career coach. First of all, meet Nia. She's 33, successful in advertising, and uh, um, has a good salary, demanding lifestyle to match it as well. But a few months ago, she got disengaged from what she's doing and from her colleagues. So she started to explore career change options and um, found quite a few books, blogs, and courses with um, quite impractical advice and often quite depressive as well, saying to start with very junior roles. Uh, she also contacted a few coaches, those who are really keen to help with her case, but required her to commit from six to 12 sessions per week, um, like weekly sessions, and uh, each of them cost a uh, hundred quid. So she did the math and thought maybe just locked down, not that, not that unhappy. So she persevered until eventually she got burned out. Luckily at that point, she came across Wodger's digital career coach. It's uh, very simple, starts with a short survey, eight questions. The questions are about two things. First, the distance of the career goal. Is it the role you want to change, the function, the industry, uh, the title of the role going freelance from full time or everything at once? And Roger algorithm doesn't care about the specific roles because from the neuroscience perspective, uh, the change is handled by our brain the same way for any change and it creates the same traps and we can use the same tools to make it collaborate. The, sec the, the second thing we ask for is the barrier that stands in the way and combining these two things, the algorithm offers the first set of tasks that incrementally gets the user closer to their goal. And as they go through these tasks, they fill in uh, their insights and these insights append to their profile and the new uh, tasks get added to their roadmap. This way they get to their career goal eventually. And each task is kept at 30 minutes. They're easy to fit into one schedule, quick to tick off and give you this dopamine to, to get going. We focus first on a very small scenario within career coaching, specifically career change. But even this scenario and this problem is massive. Half of professionals want a career change, but nine out of 10 don't go through it and uh, stay in their current jobs unhappy, often to the extent of mental illness. And just to the American and British economies, it costs over $250 billion per year. And uh, longer term, we see ourselves as a go-to solution for everything related to career happiness. 
and there is a gap in the market for it. There are some juicy valuations, big names uh, on the employee development side, but these companies are forced by their clients to optimize for HR KPIs, like employee retention and uh, productivity. So that's often in, com in conflict what, with what we optimize for, and that's uh, customer happiness. So sometimes the customer needs to leave the job to, to actually be happier. There are B2C solutions as well, but they base their value on human coaching. Often it's marketplaces, but that we remember near that comes at the price of a hundred per hour. So Voja is filling the gap of uh, digital personalization at an affordable price. So basically doing what self-help apps did for uh, therapy, but for career coaching. And there is money in this market already, $56 billion. And its growth has accelerated since COVID. People in fellow are rethinking the viability of their jobs. Uh, professionals working from home are enjoying the flexibility and want to keep it. There are more digital jobs um, available on the market, 30% more. So this all is triggering more and more changes in the market. And uh, by 2030, that means that 375 million people will need to change roles or careers. By servicing only 3% of those changes, which is addressable market gets to $1.2 billion. We have already a live product uh, and users uh, using it. And uh, some of them even achieve their first goal. After they do that, uh, they can set up their next goal, like getting a promotion or achieving a better work-life balance. And they can go on like that until retirement or even beyond. So because it's a long-term usage product, uh, we offer a subscription. And there's three levels based on at which pace the customer wants to move um, at this particular moment. As a team of founders, we have a perfect set of skills to deliver on this vision. Uh, Anna, my co-founder, has most recently been leading a data science team at Amazon Fresh, delivering hyper-personalization and dynamic selection for groceries. And that's the exact same algorithms and, te and technologies that we are using to match our users with the best bite-sized tasks on our platform. Um, she's also a trained coach with the Neuroscience Institute, and that's the leading um, organization in neuroscience-based coaching. My background is building products. I've taken lots of ideas from zero to one, uh, mentored and advised startups, including at, start, start, at tech startups. Okay, Liz, that's your time up. So if you could start wrapping up, please. Ah, oh, that's it. <laughs> well, you've got, yeah, I, I'll give you 15 seconds uh, cool. to, to wrap things up. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's, that's all about us. And we've been bootstrapping and now we're raising 250K uh, to get to our next milestone, mainly investing in tech. Thank you. Okay, great stuff. Uh, over to you, Stefan, why don't you kick us off? Um, yeah, so first quick question, so I understand it right. Is, is it a chatbot effectively, or is it more like an indexed uh, lexicon where you can look up stuff? Great question. Uh, it is not a chatbot, and I personally uh, don't like chatbots, but actually there is science behind it. So in terms of coaching, um, human coaching works, uh, self-coaching works as well. So that's the second most efficient and that's where we are. So we are basically providing tools uh, and exercises for self-coaching. And that's um, a lot of it is text, but some of it is interaction. Uh, AI, so interface that pretends to be a human doesn't work as a coach. <laughs> so because of it, actually chat, chatbot based coaching doesn't work. So, so it's like an in, 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 in it's basically a resource where you can look up like heuristics or, or stuff and then basically you can book the human add-on effectively. Uh, you can book a human add-on, but we want to be digital first because we want to increase the, the okay. market for whom it's available. And uh, you, you also not just consume content, but you also feed back into the content and it digests what your reflection, what you've submitted as reflections. Okay. Like to cur provide cur cur curate, curated content and just last follow up. So are you are you B two C or are you B two B two C? Are you do you have any like how how is it going with partnerships or how you want to distribute that? Yeah, B two B two C. B two B right now is mainly employers. So as I said, that's a bit of in conflict with our vision. Uh, but we are looking at uh, employee perk aggregators. So sitting more on the mental health kind of well being side, uh, and uh, universities uh, skills courses skills aggregators. Um, and right now we've got uh, two partnerships coming up in May. Uh, one is a tech conference and the other one is similar to what Sam uh, said about like a loyalty program. So at Sweatcoin, people will be able to redeem um, uh, our offer 
for their coins. So that's the immediate one, but longer term, we want more industry focused ones, so skills, universities, some government programs potentially as well, tackling uh, unemployment and skills gap. Okay, okay. Thank you. great stuff. Over to you, Andrew. Hi, Liz. Hi, Liz, again. Um, hi, hi. Fantastic presentation. You know, I loved you last time. I think it's a great, a great business, great opportunity. So I'll let the, uh, I'll let my other panel members. Nice to see you. Thank okay. you. What, what's, what's your pre-money valuation? Uh, so we are looking to give away 10 to 15 percent, depending on how much you raise. OK, fine. OK. Over to you, Thank Michael. You. Then. Thank you. Yeah, hi, Liz. Um, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'm invested in a business called Nikis, N-I-K-K-N-I-N-I-I-K-I-I-S. -I 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 mm -hmm. And, and what this does is it kind of takes, it approaches the, 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 the situation with a slightly advanced mode. What it, it's, it's targeting HR departments um, to try to avoid the scenario where people get you know, disillusioned with a business. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and tries to allow them to um, retrain and to, to add skills, um, you know, proactively before they kind of burn out. Mm -hmm. um, do you see that as something that you could offer as a product to enterprises? Because uh, I can see this being a, um, an interesting product that you could sell in on, on a you know seat by seat basis, and I and I think more companies are recognizing that they need to do more for their employee base, um, specifically to ensure that they they don't burn out. So uh, yes, yes and no, um, no in the way that uh, there is it's quite a busy space right now with the with big names like Better Up and Coach Hub. And uh, the second reason being that we've, we've had initial conversations being, being from big companies as well uh, with the HR departments and they do want uh, to, to optimize for people staying. And because we are building a data model, we are basically telling the model, um, measure whether people stay <laughs> and then uh, optimize whatever your matching algorithm is for that. And that's not always um, the best for, for the customer. Uh, and, uh, Obviously, there is win-win, but if, if you just set this as a, as a target, um, it may not be a win for the customer, and that's what we've, what we've heard. And, um, but we also have seen the tendency among uh, kind of more progressive employers to not care as much about retention, so care about the happiness, but not care about uh, retention and care more about the kind of alumni brand, you know, so when people even left the company, which it becomes a norm, they still talk well and the brand is great and they bring, uh, bring referrals. So because of it, we don't close this door. We just think the market may need to get a bit riper for it. And for now we, we get through a slightly different partnerships. Right. And, and, and how do you think about churn? Because, um, you know, I can see people getting excited about this initially and um, going to sort of core uh, resources and then finding the answers and being inspired by the answers and then thinking, well, <laughs> what? <laughs> great, I don't need it anymore. So, yeah. so how do you think about that as churn? Good, good, good for them, I think, if, if that's the case. Uh, in, in a way, um, everyone we've talked to so far at almost any point of their life have some kind of a career goal, uh, irrespective of where they are. And if people, like normally people want to progress and because they progress, it's usually a new challenge every time. So it can be first time becoming a people manager or moving countries or doing something else. Um, and because challenges are new, they, they trigger the same um, kind of barriers and, and traps in, in the brain. So, so having this, these tools at hand um, should, be, should be helpful. So we pretty much think of it like as a gym, gym app where you continue going to it even when you know what to do. Um, one other thing that's important for coaching is accountability. And uh, we are kind of uh, hacking that by having a community and having um, like group group sessions. So without having a human coach, you need to go to just to, to check your homework, you know, every week <laughs> and charge you a hundred for that. You still are accountable that you're progressing towards the role. So that's like all the marathon as well with like eating or uh, not, not the marathons you ran, <laughs> but the, the other ones. Yeah. Okay, you. great stuff. 
Um, okay, brilliant. Thank you, Liz. Uh, you. Now we're going to head over to Van and Open Art Source. Hello, everybody. Let me just show my screen. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Maybe if we can go full screen. Oh, sorry. Okay, oh, perfect. My, my um, here we go. Right. Good okay. evening. Bear with me a second. We'll get you started. Okay, Lan, uh, tell us about Open Art Source. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to pitch here. Open Art Source is building the Robin Hood of the art market. The art market is the last big international opaque market out there. You can know the price of everything else in the world, but not the price of most artwork. Market is built on exclusion is available only for the super rich and celebrity crowd. We intend to change that and open it for retail investors. Artists have specific issues with today's art market. Most artists can get the gallery showing. Uh, the mathematics of running a gallery in a big city are cruel. And it's very hard for gallery, gallery owner to actually be able and show new or inexperienced artists. The current market is about $65 billion a year. Most of the money is made in secondary and tertiary art sales. Artists see almost nothing of that money. They are the market, market maker, but it's really hard for them to make money. Also, artists are really talented and many times it's amazing to get to know them as we know, but most of them are not good at internet marketing and it's really hard for them to find an audience. It's a big challenge. Collectors have a different set of issues. The biggest one is there's no data in the market. 76% of art sales are private, so there's no data whatsoever. The last 24% is from public auction, and you can think that the auction is public and the data is public, but it's actually not true. Usually after the auction, the data is taken, stuffed into a database that you have to pay a subscription fee to see. Most people tend not to do it. The market seems to be rife with fraud. Some very credible uh, market players say that over 50% of the art is fake or not original. There is no infrastructure to invest in art like you would invest in stocks, bond, or other financial instruments. It's very hard to do that today. So what are we gonna do? We're gonna provide free immutable blockchain data about art sales transactions, artist price projections, and market segments. The data will allow retail investors <clears throat> to make data-driven decisions and investment uh, opportunities. And we will allow retail investor to start using art as an investment vehicle. We develop an AI platform that can actually provide provenance at scale. We can take pictures of the original art from the artist, the one for the collector and make sure that it's the same one and not a fake. We will provide automatic royalties to artists for secondary and tertiary art sales on our platform. So how it's gonna look? It can look like that. This is an example of a homepage from the app that we're building. Uh, there's another AI engine that looks at all the users. Every user sees what they like, what they prefer, see, and also provides recommendation according to its logic of what you might like and it will create immediate connections between interested buyers and artists who can provide what they like. Every artist will get a page uh, with its data on it that buyers can take a look, can assess and see if they want to invest in it. And obviously there will be art related data. This is a, a graph showing the evolution in size through the years in Kenneth's work. If you think about it, we're actually building the data layer of the art market. This is a, a <clears throat> graph showing the median price of Kenneth's work since, since he started to sell and open outsource. This is another graph uh, regarding, let's say the picture of the parrot that we saw two slides before, and it actually compares the price of this period to price of other similar art sold on, a, on open outsource. This is a, a graph that's showing what materials uh, 
Kenneth is using to create an art. This is the size that we just discussed. This is a graph that tells you what is the monthly output of uh, Kenneth as an artist. Some artists are very prolific. It can create a glut in the market and affect the pricing. Some artists- And just to let you know, you've got 30 seconds left. Okay, so we're continuing. We have two revenue models, subscribers and transactions. We take 50% of the transaction and, and $60 a year per, per subscriber. First year, we do not charge a subscriber. We start in the second year. We will lose money on 2021 and 2022, start making money on 2023. My co-founder, Cecil, and myself put already put $100,000 into open outsource. Uh, and we're looking for $5 million at the, at, for 20% of the company. In the next five years, open outsource will make art a potential part of every retail investor portfolio. It will grow the 65 billion ma market to a much bigger size. We have a team of grizzled internet warriors who worked on huge project for the biggest companies in the world. We can do this. Thank you for your time. Okay, all right. Perfect, thanks Lan. Um, okay, so uh, let's kick off with uh, Andrew since you um, missed out on the last round. Hi, um, Ilan, thank you. Um, wow, what a task. I mean, you've got, uh, there's a huge number of vested interests in maintaining the current status quo. Obviously you're aware of that. Um, uh, I can quite see I mean, to be honest, lots of your your what you're trying to do, I can actually get separately on different subscriptions. So, I mean, I collect particular artists, obviously you can see behind. Um, and, and I, I, you know, I have uh, auction watches, you know, where something comes up, it, 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 it alerts me and that's a subscription model and I can find out, you know, um, provenance. I, I think the most interesting thing using blockchain is actually trying artists as they become more successful and their paintings are sold second third fourth hand that they actually get get some 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 capture from that upside i think that's very very interesting can you talk a little bit more about how that's going to work because i think that's that's very interesting so young artists i am not surprised that you're a collector and i'm surprised that you have such beautiful art behind you uh, most people can't really do that and in at least in new york the galleries would not sell to anyone even if they have the money to buy a specific item but for young artists to actually to be able to get in into a, a, a market show what they have and then connect with artists you know one to one almost uh, and it is a mobile application. So it is on your phone. Your phone is always with you and people use it for like a gazillion times a day for different tasks. This will be a way for somebody who's interested in art. We've spoken to hundreds of people at least about this application. Nobody told me I hate art. Everybody loves it. You're not always buying it, but you love it. You, you're interested in it. This is an opportunity for artists, young artists to show what they can do, show pricing publicly and then help collectors make a decision if this is the right thing that they want to put their money into. But so many artists, young artists, and I actually, um, I follow a, a lot of young artists. I go along to the um, uh, Royal College of Art summer shows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's where I get a lot of my new work. Um, a lot of them are using the internet to, you know, they've got their own Instagram accounts. They've got their own webs, uh, websites where they're, where they're transacting themselves and, and talking about uh, projects they're doing at the moment and, and, and paintings for sale. So there's lots of opportunity to be able to buy directly from artists and cut out the gallery margin, which is normally at least 50%. Yes, I agree. And there are millions of websites like that. And there's like at least a thousand companies or more who will build you an artist website, but then most of those websites don't work. There's no traffic coming to them. And even though you met some really, really a amazing young artists who know how to market on the internet. That's not the overall picture. Most artists that we speak to, and not everybody's 18 and 19, even people in the 40s or 50s are still beginning in their art career. They didn't sell a lot. 
It's hard okay. for them to do it. And we're going uh, to wrap that question for now. So give, give okay. the other judges a, a, a chance. Um, and let's head over to, to Stefan. Nope. Yeah, I need to un I need to unmute myself. Yeah. Um, what, what what I'm curious is, um, you know, where where are you now? Like, what, what's your inventory now? I mean, you 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 you're trying to command quite a high valuation. Like, how many artists do you actually have on the platform yet? And how many transactions has it have actually happened? I'm I'm curious on on your traction, effectively. We're building the platform. Okay, it's not working yet. We will start the actual. Uh, sales on the same on the first quarter of next year and we got to the valuation uh, we actually have a very uh, detailed spreadsheet that i can share with you if you are really interested in uh, looking into our numbers but just in general if you think for a second how much you, it takes to uh, take an idea like that it's a relatively big idea and take it from an idea to actually something that's working and transacting on the blockchain and doing all that, it's going to take four to five years. It's going to take about that amount of money. But but uh, but how many do you have a waiting list of artists or how many? Artists? Yeah 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 yeah. We I did mean, a trial. We did a trial on Facebook and Instagram, and we just offered artists to to participate in the beta. They had to answer nine questions in order to even be qualified to participate. And in about one month, by spending $1,100, we got more than 600 artists to wanting to participate. So I think we have a really good traction with artists. It's not gonna be a problem to bring them up. The challenge will be how to persuade collectors and galleries to participate in the market. And we have good plans on doing that also. Yeah, okay. okay. You. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, thank you, Elian. Um, are you an artist yourself? I am, my education is in film and television. That's my, and my co-founder Cecil is an artist who is also an amazing software developer and architect and we're working together on that. We yeah, both I can, come from I can, backgrounds of art. I can obviously hear that, I can hear the passion um, and, and your desire to, to create something in the industry. So well done for that. Um, I guess there's two things. Um, have you, I mean, we're, we're going through a big um, NFT um, craze at the moment. Um, have you thought about how that impacts your app and, and, um, and how that impacts the, the, the sort of the thesis in general? Yes. So NFTs are the lowest hanging fruit on the blockchain tree. It is the easiest thing to take a bunch of pixels as beautiful as they are and put a token on them. But the art world is much bigger than just NFTs. And physical art is much more complex and hard to tokenize. And we found a solution for that, to for provenance, tracking, and ownership all in one token. And the ability to allow people who are not te technologically very adept to do that without having to use other tools. So we will have NFTs, we will sell those pixels, of course, but we actually go to the bigger universe of artwork and do physical art. So, so I was um, I was a little confused as to because I think you started saying you know you're you're going to champion the cause of sort of almost the democratization of art in the sense of making it available to to the populace and then on the other hand you were helping artists get, get you know sort of gain value on resale um, and then protecting investors from provenance and so I was just wondering where the core angle was now I mean I have you know I've got a Connor Brothers. Um, large image there and I've got um, Lorenzo Quinn statues and I've got Russell Young and I've got Mr. Brainwash um, and I've and I've bought them all from the artists right via 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 galleries but I've actually bought them with the artist standing there mm -hmm. um, in, all, in all cases so my provenance I'm very comfortable with that provenance and I also buy things that I like um, not so much for investment Mm -hmm. um, even though my wife tells me the diamonds I have to buy here are all investments, but she never, she never has sold, sold one ever. But um, so, you know, for me, it, it's more about what I like. And I, and I just wonder where, where your real focus is, what, what, what is the, the, the primary problem that you believe you're solving? You know, I think the primary problem I'm solving <clears throat> is the lack, of the, the lack of data in the art market. The market is opaque and it's very hard to know what's good. Yes, it's great 
to stand near the artist and buy art from them or with them, it's the best experience. We don't want to replace it, we can't. But most of the time, it's not like that. And again, most of the money in the market is not somebody like yourself who going to a gallery and buying from the artist is secondary, tertiary, and after that, sales. That's what the real money is. And for that, you got to have some kind of a provenance. There's a huge industry that does it one by one. We offer to do that at scale. We offer to do it in a way that will make people very comfortable that what they're buying is the real thing. We actually came to it from the, from the angle of the artist. We think that the artists are getting a raw deal in the market right now. They are the market maker, but they're the one who making the least money in it. So we want to try to change that. We want to try to make it more fair, change the balance of power. Great stuff, Lan. And um, uh, we'll call it a, a, a day on the, on the questions there. But uh, once again, I, I see a bit of a theme running through all of our uh, pitches tonight, and then that is data. Uh, once again, going back, back, back to data. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much, Lan. And uh, next, uh, we're heading over to Matthew and uh, my pocket skill. Thanks, guys. Okay, so if we could get your pitch deck up, please. And this will be our final pitch for the evening. Right. Okay, full screen. Okay. Cool. Five minutes. Go for it. So, hi, I'm Matthew, and I'm co-founder of My Pocket Skill. Um, and I'm going to tell you all about how we are creating a financially empowered Gen Z connecting young people to save, earn, and learn about money using a behavioral science approach. So our story starts before the pandemic when we observed that there's a really big gap in teens' desires to earn flexibly and a complete lack of opportunities to do so. So all those opportunities for teenagers to use their skills and earn money were already becoming scarce. Things teens used to do like Saturday jobs and paper rounds, they've been in terminal decline for years. And that leads to a second problem. Because of this lack of experience, young people don't build those early positive habits with money. And in the UK, there's now 11 and a half million working adults that have less than 100 pounds in savings. So to address this problem, we built my pocket skill. And that's a digital solution. And that's where young people can connect with pocket money earning tasks. They can set savings goals and they can learn about money. We currently run two streams. So teen tutors who provide peer coaching in academic, music and creative subjects and digital teens who offer digital skills such as social media management, design, user testing and where we have a three year, three year framework agreement with the BBC providing young people to test, test their digital products. So things like iPlayer and Bite Size. In terms of our product, we have a scalable digital platform and we differentiate on the basis that First of all, we engage really effectively with our teens through live onboarding. We use gamification. For example, we level up our users to, to higher pay. And then we use behavioral nudges to encourage savings towards goals. We also have a whole raft of safety and trust features through parental moderation and verification. Our product has a lot of magnetism to attract young people to sign up. Money's a great motivator to start with. But then our next step is to offer e-wallet accounts, and that's going to be to able to, enabling us to hold Gen Z earnings and savings on our platform. We operate at the intersection of teen tasks, financial wellness and teen finance. For us, there are synergies across all three. So financial education, that's been a really significant sector in the US, is beginning to take off here. We are uniquely positioned with our learning by doing approach. Teen finance has also been attracting particular interest recently with STEP funded by Stripe recently raising 50 million in Series B and Y Combinator company Greenlight raising a $1.2 billion valuation. So we're currently growing on average 15% month on month and we have a 96% booking rate. Our revenues are further supplemented through an innovation pilot that we're running with the government's money and pension service and that's being rolling out, that enables us to roll out our earn, save, learn approach. We estimate there's a 10.4 billion earning potential in our team demographic, which our platform unlocks. Further down the line with a financially active user base, we are perfectly positioned 
for a wider teen finance markets. Our business model is currently based on commission from households and corporate customers, but there are other opportunities relating to this underserved demographic. We're generating revenue through the platform, including financial education, which we plan to double this year. We've developed a playbook on customer acquisition. So teens we acquire through ambassadors, referral schemes and paid social. And that's at a CAC of around two pounds. Demand side, we market directly to households as well as by employers and financial well wellness programs. So let me tell you about the team behind this. So my background is in leading creation of successful digital, digital products, and I have a previous exit. My co-founder Zara and I are both domain specialists in youth policy and financial education. Zara also has expertise in financial services and impact investment. Our advisors include the CEO of one of the fastest growing fintechs in the UK, who's taken his own startup to almost a billion valuation in less than six years. Our funding need is currently 750k, and that's to take us to 64,000 users and 100k monthly run rate within the next 24 months. And we've already secured more than half towards this through a combination of non-dilutive grants and contracts, as well as commitments from angels. So to sum up, we're helping Gen Zs to earn, save and learn about money. And we'd be delighted for you to join us on our journey. Thank you. Perfect, Matthew. And with five seconds to spare, so spot on. Um, OK, uh, let's head over to Michael to kick us off with the questions here. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate that, Matthew. Um, I'm actually a founder investor in People Per Hour and TaskRabbit, um, and I, I, I find them very, very useful. And my wife uses Fiverr all the time for bits and pieces on Instagram rather than go through the laborious pain of editing stuff herself. Um, so I, 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 I truly get the, uh, the concept of, um, of online um, task platforms. I guess my, my one question is, um, and, and my kids always want to make money, that's for sure, um, or they want to get money. I don't know whether they want to make it or not, but they definitely want to get it. Um, but, but I guess my, my question is, you know, if, if, I, if I was somebody that wanted a task from a child, and you did mention the sort of the, 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 the checks and, 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 and sort of balances there you need in, to make sure it's a secure environment, but you know, do, do, well, how do I get, how would I get access to that platform? Do I have to go through a sort of a DBS check before or, you know, what, what would be the, you know, could someone just sign up and use, use kids for, for, for tasks? So, so the simple, quick, simple answer, short answer is, is no, you can't just sign up and start using it without a form of verification to, to, get, to get you going. And, and I think, you know, part of what's the special source and what we've been developing is the right kind of verification and parental moderation that sits behind the platform. So for instance, if you're still at school age, so if you're still under 18, then all of our young users have a parent profile that's the parent signs up alongside and they sit behind. So all the conversations that happen on the platform and through our messaging system um, and through our chat, there's always a parent in the background to understand what's going on. So that's, I guess that's that's how one, of the, one of the ways that the, the teens stay safe to do this. Um, but also in terms of verification on our demand side for customers, that kind of depends on what, what the task is actually. So I've obviously through COVID, what we've been doing is we've been focusing on online tasks and digital tasks. So we've been doing lots of um, you know, providing young people for ed tech companies, for example, to go and, go and test their new version of their uh, revision app as an example um, and there the safety profile is pretty low because actually everything is trans, uh, trans, transmitted online and it can be done safely. Um, once we get into face-to-face -face tasks um, we've also got another layer of verification that we introduce as well so if you want to start hiring a, hiring a team to come and work you know, physically in an office um, there's another layer of checking and verification that we do and we use a third-party provider to do a lot of that uh, in conjunction with us. Okay thank you. Okay, great stuff. Uh, and over to you, Stefan. Um, similar question I had before, like um, how are you about to acquire users? Do you have any, um, I mean, you, since when are you been going? And, um, you know, how, what's your customer acquisition cost and do you have any partnerships to, to facilitate that? 
I mean, you have how many users? 4,000 users now? And how, how you want to get that to, how you want to scale that? What's the strategy? So, so first of all, good question, Stefan. And so, first, so first of all, we spent a lot of time with my pocket skill um, just on piloting in terms of getting getting the right profile right and the right kind of interactions going between our users. So we piloted in two just two geographic locations to do that for quite a while to understand how it would work and the, the dyna dynamics between our different types of customers. Um, for example, what. Uh, um, a household would be happy to do, what a business would be happy to do, what kind of work teams were interested in. Um, and that gave us a lot of insight to what we actually wanted to build. So we launched the, the, a fully fledged version of the product in uh, late October last <laughs> year. Um, and that's been a ground up development. And that's a version that's, that's going to enable us to scale across the UK. And so since then, we've started to really begin to acquire uh, users will begin to market in earnest. So it's really only, only the about four, past four months that we've been doing that. Um, in terms of a bit more detail on our user acquisition strategy, so for, for teens, for the supply side, um, obviously a very key audience for us, um, we've been running um, an ambassador scheme. So we bring in ambassadors um, and they basically promote us to, our, to their schools across their social media accounts. Um, and we've also been running referral programs via ambassadors as well. Um, that's, that's been very useful. Um, and we've also been uh, pushing uh, referrals through our social media channels as well, doing some social media marketing. Uh, we found that the CAC on our supply side is around two pounds. So um, obviously there's a really strong uh, pull factor in terms of the ability to earn money when opportunities to do so in that demographic are so scarce. Then in terms of the other side of the platform, our demand side, so through households, um, one is through parental groups. So again, you know, th there's lots of parental groups that, that we've signed up to as my, my pocket skill and we begin to promote through that. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of organic interest through, through households for things like um, music lessons, dance lessons, creative subjects, you know, everything from chess and Rubik's Cube, you, you know, you name it, to those, to those groups. Um, but we also, you know, we know where to find those, those kind of audiences on Facebook as well. So that's a relatively fruitful way of promoting us. Um, and then we also use corporate partnerships. So some of our uh, corporate partners that we're working with are beginning to promote us to their employees um, as, a, as a work at home benefit, because lots of these parents are still struggling to, to work at home. They've got kids around uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the holiday time. Um, so they're using us a benefit to do that. Um, and then on the corporate side, finally, that's more of a B2B sales approach. So, and, th and then we're going after those as big individual customers. So for the BBC, for instance, that was a procurement process that we've gone through. We're not out, no, on, a, on a rather formal framework with them, um, but that gives us access to a whole host of departments within the corporation. So, you know, bite size, iPlayer and so forth. Um, and, uh, you know, we want, that, we want that as a kind of B2C model for, for corporates to really begin to roll out a bit more as well, because that gives us those kind of curated opportunities that we can offer our teams. Mm. And now you fully launched, where, where do you want to be in terms of like uh, on, on your marketplace? How many people do you want to have that can provide tasks in a year and, and how many transactions? What's sort of like the, the outlook? So, um, so in terms of where we want to be, so our, our, our raise goals are to get to 64,000 users in, over the next 24 months. Um, and we're already, I mean, we're, we're beginning to ramp up. So this month, we'll, we're gonna, it's gonna be close to 500. Um, uh, and we're expecting that to, to increase and ramp up through the year. Um, in terms of the split, so we're about something like two, six, 60 to 70% of our users are supply side. Um, and this is what we found is optimal in terms of how the the platform needs to balance in terms to make sure that we're satisfying all of the task requests that we get through the platform. So there's a so there's like a sort of 70-30 split in terms of that 64,000 um, users that we're aiming to get to. Okay, Thank you. thanks. We're gonna push you on. Uh, so Andrew for the final question of the evening. Hi, um, very interesting. And I'm, I'm, I'm really keen about um, Gen Z uh, learning about uh, particularly finances and everything else. Um, I was involved in a little business, which I won't mention, um, which is actually trying to repatriate um, the child trust um, 
fund money that uh, Mr. Brown gave everybody up between, I think, 2005 to 2011, which is obviously hitting your demographic, half of which haven't been, hasn't been claimed and is between 250 and 750 pounds per child born between those two dates. Um, it's, it's about repatriating that. You've spoken a little bit about um, saving and, and, and learning about money. What, what are the sort of jobs that you're getting um, Gen Z to do and, so, and able to offer? So, uh, so, so we're, uh, we've been focusing it principally on online tasks through the pandemic, obviously. Um, so for households, that's largely focused on what, what we call teen tutoring. So this may be either tutoring at a peer-to-peer -peer level or it may be tutoring a, a slightly younger child. So it may be someone that's doing A-level math, for instance, helping and coaching someone through their GCS, GCSEs. Mm. Um, and because they've just done that and the syllabus is really fresh, we actually find that it's a really useful, really productive, really relatable uh, experience. Um, the, the other thing which we've seen a lot of interest over the last few months has been around music and music coaching. And that's either someone, you know, taking up an instrument the first time and wants someone as a, almost like a role model to help them learn. Um, or it can be someone that needs a bit of extra coaching. So they may, may have an, um, already have a music teacher that may want a bit of extra coaching or someone to give them uh, some interesting ideas and inspiration. So there's a lot of inspirational activities around this. Um, and then on the other um, slant that we're offering at the moment, which we call digital teens. Um, this is a range of digital skills. So everything from kind of creative digital. So things like, you know, design, logo production, photography, right the way to some more formal skills. Some of them are offering uh, things like coding and also um, social media, obviously where Gen Zs really are the stars. <laughs> so um, we've got some teams that are, that are managing social media accounts and writing blogs. Okay. okay, that's useful. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, great stuff. Uh, and I guess uh, one question from the from the audience. Um, uh, so from from Nabil, how do you certify or, or ensure the skill of the team, and so to make sure that they're actually given a good 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 standard of service? So so one of the things that we discovered uh, during our piloting was that actually uh, what we need to do is, is package the teams that we're offering to other people. So we run, um, a, I guess, a careful process of onboarding. And during the onboarding phase, what we're, what we're trying to do effectively is understand what those skills are, what talents, what the capabilities they can offer, um, and also coach as to the kind of appropriate behaviours uh, on the platform and how to deal you know, with a, essentially how to deal with the customer, because a lot of these teams won't have ever been in that position before. So what we're doing is we're kind of coaching and we're packaging, um, and then we make that introduction. And what we what we encourage the other side to do, the household, if they're taking someone on, I don't know, let's say to choose a maths, um, to have an initial discussion and to, to be comfortable with themselves about kind of, yes, this is the right person, the wrong person. Um, and, you know, the it's, it's, it's often a, a relatively small commitment on their part. We're not asking people to pay for a whole block of lessons up front. Um, so we normally find that works pretty well. Um, and we've got a 96% rebooking rate. So we like to think that's a, a good indication of the, the kind of caliber that we're offering. Okay, so sorry, 96% is so uh, that is returning customers rebooking a teenager for another skill. Yeah. Okay, okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, a great final presentation to end on. Um, so as a next uh, step, um, I'll ask the judges uh, to send in um, uh, their results uh, graded, uh, uh, the, the start of presentations from uh, favorite to, 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 to last place. Um, and uh, we, if we could also um, put the, um, uh, the voting uh, on, on online as well for the audience uh, who can vote as well uh, on who they consider uh, to be the best. I'll hand over to that. Okay. Um, okay, and then Daniel, if we could get the, the slides up. And we'll hand over. Uh, so whilst we wait for the, the, the scores and the judges to, 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 to come through, um, I'm going to hand you over to my co-founder, Ben, um, and who is also our community director, just to tell, tell you a little bit more about what it is that we do um, at EC um, and uh, 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 some of the benefits that, that, that we offer. 
Thanks, Michael. Um, a big thank you to all the pitchers tonight and the judges um, for a fantastic evening, um, especially Marco uh, from Balbero, who, who stepped in very late um, as we had a cancellation. So thank you, Marco, for, for jumping in at such short notice. Uh, really good to see um, so many of our members here this evening. Um, also a lot of uh, new faces as well, I can see in the audience. Um, so welcome and it's lovely to have you with us uh, to give you an idea of, of what we do. We, um, we bring founders together um, to help them succeed um, and, and provide them with all the help, benefits, introductions along the way to, to give them every chance of success. So we do that through, um, through events like this evening, uh, workshops, roundtables, uh, access to mentors. But for those who are looking for investment, we, um, we do deck reviews, uh, investor reports, introductions, opportunity to, um, to pitch at evenings like tonight. Uh, just quickly, Daniel, I can see people are asking for the poll. I don't think it's it's popped up yet. We can have some problems. It doesn't seem to be working. I'm trying to to, to do it, but okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, access to, um, to to credit schemes, uh, which I think we have a, a, the next slide. Um, we'll show some of them. Uh, introduction uh, introductions to to our partners. Introductory offers. Um, free consultations. Um, we're here to help at every step of the way, whether you're looking for investment or scaling up, there's an awful lot we can do to, to help founders. And please don't be a stranger. If you're here for the first time tonight, I'll put my LinkedIn in the chat. Um, it'd be great to hear from you. Uh, great to grab a call. Great to learn about you um, and see if we might be able to work together. I hit, yeah, keep going down. Perfect next event uh, for those who want to come along is on Wednesday the 28th. Uh, it is uh, a founder workshop from MVP to BMV, B, BVP. Um, it's with Ritam, who is a long-term friend and partner of the Entrepreneurs Collective. Um, I think Mike said several times if he wishes he had met Ritam um, at that stage of his journey um, and the feedback we get is, is always fantastic. He's got um, an awful lot to offer, so please do come along. Um, is free to register, I believe, Daniel? Yeah, correct, thank you. Perfect, yes, yeah, so, so we hope to see you all there. Yeah. Okay, great stuff. Um, we're, we're just trying to sort out the, the, the poll, though uh, it looks like it may not be working. Um, but whilst we uh, have a few minutes uh, to spare and we wait for the, the final results to come through, um, uh, I'm going to take advantage of having 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 you here, uh, Michael, um, uh, to tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, how you managed to run 40 marathons in 40 days, <laughs> as well as uh, running, uh, uh, um, uh, working. I believe you were still working at the more at that point as a CEO of a of a. Uh, a billion pound turnover company. Well, actually, um, I, I just sold that business, and uh, but I was still non-exec of multiple businesses at the time. Um, and uh, I was running them from half past three in the morning to half past eight in the morning. Um, and then going home, having an ice bath, a large breakfast, then getting on with my day job. So if anyone says they don't have time for a, for exercise, they're, they're, um, <laughs> they're, they're, they're cheating themselves. But um, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, the first ones, the first ones were tough, um, and then they actually got got easier. Believe it or not, every day um, brought its own challenges and its own blisters and everything else. But um, generally, it's a mindset, um, you know. And a, and a marathon's 42, 42 kilometers, or you know, it's it's simply forty two thousand steps, and and one step in front of the other is is the way to get them done. Um, and so I think um, it's, it's mind over matter is, is very much that case. And of course, this time last year, I was in the South Pole um, and trekked to the South Pole to raise money for children with brain tumors. And um, that was more brutal than, yeah. uh, than 40 marathons in 40 days. All right. OK, <laughs> wow. And, and uh, so are we, are we ready for an exclusive to find out what you're doing next? Or is this still under embargo? Uh, it's under embargo until I can convince my wife to let me go. But um, yeah, it's well after forty marathons and a trip to the ice pole uh, to the North Pole, uh, uh, the mind boggles at how you're going to top. Uh, well, I, I have a plan, but uh, she says once I start socialising it, it becomes facts. So she won't let me do it until she's comfortable with it. Okay, okay, fair <laughs> enough, fair enough. Okay, um, so unfortunately, we haven't the the poll isn't working. Um, so we're going to have to uh, uh, we're, we're we're relying on the judges' scorecards. Um, solely for this one. 
Um, and um, uh, in second place, or run. Oh, oh, wow. Okay. I take it all back. Okay. So uh, it looks like we finally, the poll has come up. Uh, so please um, uh, do, um, do vote. Okay. Okay, brilliant. We'll give it a couple more minutes. Um, uh, and in the meantime, um, whilst we, we wait for the, the rest of the audience to vote, um, Andrew, I, I know you're an expert in fundraising, uh, and all, I, I see that all of our, um, all of our panel are um, uh, currently, I mean, sorry, all of our contestants are currently fundraising. Do you have a, a few tips for our, 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 our guys on, 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 on how to, uh, to, to improve their fundraising game? Of Andrew, can we unmute Andrew? Actually, sorry, I think. So I know. Keep it, keep it simple. Focus on the core proposition. Yeah. Be realistic. Um, two certainties in startups: it'll take longer and cost more, <laughs> um, and, and and you'll get it wrong by definition. Um, you know, I think. Keeping, I mean, everyone seems to focus on the deck and sort of forget about the pitch. Um, you know, I think, I think really, you really do have just a couple of minutes to to grab someone's attention. Um, you know, especially busy people. You know, VC. I'm not VC. I'm, I'm just a I'm just an angel. But um, I think um, uh, being realistic, knowing your market, knowing your competition. Um, and uh, really just trying to be really realistic in terms of valuation. You know, I'm, 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 I'm not going to comment on, on the, I, I thought the ones tonight were, were, were very interesting and, and, and mostly realistic. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and don't follow fashion. You know, there's so much going on at the moment. Everyone's trying to get in the same space. It's a very, very crowded space in the, all the obvious areas. Um, things that catch my eye are things that necessarily aren't um, everyone else is chasing. I mean, you know, the, the other two gentlemen on the panel have got just as much experience as me. Michael, off you go. Okay, perfect. That's perfect timing, uh, uh, Andrew. Um, so, um, uh, to and to just to, to, to give the results now, um, we're finally in the public poll is in, uh, as well as the judges' scorecard. So, um, and um, actually, um, sometimes we see that the judges and the public disagree, but actually, it's been fairly uh, fairly consistent across both both sectors. Um, uh, oh, so in. Pardon. So in third place, uh, we have open, uh, open art source. Uh, in second place, we have market, my pocket skill. Sorry, this is for the, the people's vote. Uh, and uh, in first place, we have uh, uh, generate. Um, and uh, it coincidentally, uh, exactly the same order uh, for the judges as well, uh, which makes generate uh, our winners for this evening. Um, so congratulations to Generate. Uh, where do we have you guys? Thank you very much. That's incredibly kind and humbling, especially because of the quality of the other pitches. So fantastic. I look forward to networking and speaking with more people shortly. Yeah, great. And when are you on Dragon's Den? This is... So it will air tomorrow on BBC One, 8pm. Um, so I think we've got the final slot so somewhere around 8 40 ish um, is when you can catch us if you missed that we're on bbc one friday morning i'm um, doing a live interview uh, between 9 15 and 10 a.m and then we've got yeah some more stuff coming next week too okay great stuff okay thank you uh right okay so we're next going to push on to the networking section Uh, so we have uh, five minutes. So firstly, we have uh, introduction. Uh, so we will move to give five minutes to each person in a networking room. Uh, so firstly, we have one minute to introduce yourself. Uh, secondly, you have one minute to offer something. Uh, 
uh, and um, uh, one minute to ask for something and then um, uh, you have a couple of minutes to discuss. All right. Um, so we will in a minute we will um, break you up into Zoom rooms and at that point uh, you guys will get uh, 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 roughly half an hour to network and chat with the the other founders uh, who are in the in the rooms with you. Uh, so um, before we do that, um, we won't be coming back. We'll call it a day at around about eight thirty. So if, for those of you who are still chatting in the networking rooms, um, but just to say thanks again to all our contestants uh, who uh, did. Uh, uh, I think it was a, an excellent evening with some really great. Uh, startups pitch, pitching, uh, uh, and thank you to uh, an excellent set of judges uh, who really pushed our contestants. Uh, thanks again to, to you all, um, and then uh, I shall see you guys uh, in the Zoom rooms shortly. Okay.